In part A, we are asked if this circuit can be reduced to a single resistor. Now, we'll notice that this circuit contains two batteries. And in general, in order for a circuit to be reducible to a single resistor, it would only contain one battery. So, because this circuit contains two batteries, the answer for part A is going to be no. We cannot reduce it to a circuit that contains a single resistor because there is more than one battery. And so that means for part B, in which we are asked to calculate the currents, we're going to have to apply the Kirchhoff's rules. So let's come down and take a closer look at this circuit so that we can calculate the currents. Now, typically when analyzing a simple circuit using Kirchhoff's rules, the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is to draw in the current in each segment of the circuit or each branch of the circuit. And in this case, that's already been done for us. You'll notice that for the branch, the upper branch that we can highlight in yellow, they've already labeled the current that's flowing through that branch and they've labeled that as I1. Notice I1 would be flowing all the way throughout this branch of the circuit. So we could label I1 in a number of places in that yellow branch. But again, they've already drawn in that for us. And then in this branch, right across the middle of the circuit, they have drawn in a current, which they have labeled I3. And then in the lower branch, they've drawn in the current and they've labeled it I2. So step one actually has already been completed for us. <clears throat> Excuse me, let's move on to step two. And step two, we're going to apply the junction rule. And a junction is basically where two different wires come together. So you can see we have a junction here at point A. We also have a junction at point D. And so the junction rule basically tells us that the total current that is flowing into the junction is going to equal the total current that is flowing out of the junction. So for example, let's take a look at junction A. And if we look carefully, if we kind of take current one and draw it in for other little portions of this branch, we can see that current one is actually flowing out of junction A. Whereas current three, if we follow it along, is flowing into that junction. Current two also is flowing into the junction. If you follow current two along the bottom branch of the circuit, you can see that it is flowing into that junction as well. So both I3 as well as I2 are flowing into the junction. We can say I2 plus I3, and then the current marked I1, as we said, is flowing out of the junction. So this would be your first equation. You can box it in so that you don't forget it. And then after doing the junction rule, we're going to have to apply the loop rule. And this is usually a little bit more challenging. So let's clear some space. This is going to be our third step here. And again, it is the loop rule. And basically for the loop rule, we're going to select a continuous loop and we're going to keep track of potential changes. And so we may actually have to redraw the circuit here to get a better look at that. So let's do that. And so for our first loop rule, we're going to choose to traverse the loop that would be indicated by A, B, C, D, and then back to A. So if you look at the diagram, that would mean that we're flowing through a loop in this sort of direction that way. So starting at point A, we're going to keep track of potential changes as we move clockwise through our loop. Now, the first circuit element that we encounter while going through our loop is this battery. And you'll notice that as we're moving upward through the loop, we are moving from the negative terminal to the positive terminal of the battery. And anytime you move from a lower potential on the battery to a higher potential, you're going to have a positive potential change. And therefore, the potential change as we go through the battery is simply positive 24 volts. Then, as we go through the loop, we're going to encounter this 2 ohm resistor. Now, for resistors, we recall that the potential change is the resistance value multiplied by the current. This is basically one expression of Ohm's law. If you look carefully, I1, which was flowing also in a clockwise direction through this branch of the circuit, we would be moving in the same direction as I1 as we go through our loop. We're also moving clockwise, just like I1 is moving clockwise. So whenever you're moving with the current, you have to have a negative potential change. That's very important. So make sure you put a minus sign here, then take the resistance value of two ohms and multiply it by the current I1. 
We then continue our journey around this loop clockwise and we encounter the 4 ohm resistor. Notice again, we are still flowing with the current marked I1. So again, we're going to have a negative potential change. So we will have minus the resistance value of 4 ohms multiplied again by I1. Continuing through the loop, we encounter the resistor marked 3 ohms. We are flowing with the current again, but this time that current is actually I3. So we would do minus the resistance value of 3 ohms times I3. And finally, we return back to where we started. We return back to point A. Whenever you return to your starting point, you set the total potential change equal to zero. So this would be our second equation. We can simplify it a little bit, of course. We can combine those like terms, and we can make 24 minus 6I1 minus 3I3 is equal to zero. So that's our second equation. And because we are looking for three currents, we're going to need a third equation. So we're going to do another loop rule. This time, let's do the loop from F to A to D to E and then back to F. So if we go back to our diagram, we would be starting at point F and moving in a nice clockwise direction again. You could go counterclockwise if you wish. It's an arbitrary choice. But starting at point F, we move upward and we encounter the 12 volt battery. Again, we're moving from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. That's a positive potential change. So we'll have positive 12 volts. And then we continue our clockwise journey. And now we're encountering the three ohm resistor again. But ask yourself, am I moving with the current or against the current? And you'll notice that because I3 is flowing to the left and we are moving to the right, we're moving against the current. That's a positive potential change. Anytime you're moving against the current, it's a positive potential change. And then you take the resistance value of three ohms and multiply it by the current I3. Continuing on into the next branch here, we have I2. We are moving clockwise. I2 is also moving clockwise within that branch. So that's a negative potential change because we're moving with the current. So you'll do minus the resistance value of one and then multiply that by I2. And really one times I2 is just I2. So we can simplify that already and just make it I2. And then we continue on, we encounter the five ohm resistor. We are moving with the current again, right? Because I2 is going this way and so are we. So we do minus five ohms times I2 and we set this equal to zero. We can simplify again, we can combine those like terms. That's gonna be a minus six I2, set this equal to zero. And there is our third equation. Why don't we line up our equations together to get a better look at them? And here are those three equations. In order to solve these, what we might want to do here is take this expression for I1 and substitute it in for the second equation that we had developed. And therefore, we would have 24 minus 6 multiplied. And then I1, again, is going to be substituted with I2 plus I3. And then we have minus 3I3. This is still equal to 0. We can then distribute the negative 6 into the parentheses. So we would have 24 minus 6I2 minus 6i3 minus 3i3 is equal to 0. These like terms can be combined. They would make a minus 9i3. So let's just back up and write that out as a minus 9i3 and set this equal to 0. Now this is nice because this equation that we just generated and the third equation from our loop rule have the same variables in them. They have i2 and then they also each have I3. So we have a system of two equations with two unknowns, and that's a lot easier than a system of three equations with three unknowns. So what we'll do is we will try to solve using an elimination method. So perhaps what we should do is take this equation and scramble it. Let's rewrite it so it's 12 minus 6I2 plus 3I3 equals zero. And then as for this equation, we'll just sort of uh, stack it underneath. So we'll have the 24 minus 6i2 minus 9i3 is equal to zero. Now this is actually pretty convenient because the coefficients of the i2 are almost opposites. We want one of them to be a negative six and the other one to be a positive six. So why don't we just go through and multiply each term by negative one. So that would make this negative 24. This would become positive. This would become positive, And then zero stays zero. Once we have the coefficients of I2 as opposites, we simply add the equations together. So 12 plus negative 24 here is going to be negative 12. These will cancel because they'll become zero. And then we have 12 I3. This is really nice. We can add 12 to both sides. So now we have 12 I3 is equal to 12. And then divide 
both sides by 12, we can see that I3 is simply equal to 1 amp. So that's nice, we have I3, we can go back and find I2. We could plug it into either one of these equations. So why don't we just choose this one right here? We'll have 12 plus three times I3, which we just discovered is one amp, minus six I2 is equal to zero. Let's add the six I2 to the other side. 12 plus three, of course, is 15, and then divide both sides by six, and we see that I2 is 2.5 amps. Pretty nice. We just need I3. And that's easy because we have this nice little rule we got from the junction rule. So we take I2, which was two and a half, I3, which was the one amp, and this is equal to I1. We add these together and we can see that I1 is equal to 3.5 amps. So just to be clear here, I1 is three and a half amps, I2 is two and a half amps, and I3 is one amp.